Good morning. This public meeting of the SERS Board of Directors is being held at 30 North 3rd Street, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. By participating in this session, you are consenting to the recording, retention, and future viewing of this meeting. Although being live streamed via the internet, this meeting is a live, in-person meeting open to the public in accordance with the Sunshine Act. The live streaming of this meeting is presented as a convenience only and is not provided as the official means for public attendance. In the event the live stream fails or cannot be transmitted for any reason, the in-person public meeting will continue without interruption. For those of you participating virtually, please be reminded to mute your microphones when not actively speaking. You may proceed with the meeting at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone. I'm calling to order the regular meeting of the State Employees Retirement Board uh, on this day, Friday, June 10th, 2022. I'm Dave Fillman. I'm the chairman of the, uh, of the board. Uh, and in significance today, um, as we're all struggling with inflation and gas prices and baby formulas, keep in mind that in 1935, Alcoholics Anonymous was created. So if you do have issues, please give them a call uh, as we struggle with what we're going on with right now. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody. With that, a uh, roll call of the board members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Becker. Here. Mr. Erdman for Senator DeSanto. Here. Chairman Feldman. Present. Representative Frankel or designee. Representative Frankel or designee? Okay. Treasurer Garrity. I'm here. Senator Hughes. Present. Mr. Jordan. Here. Representative Schemmel. Here. Ms. Soderberg. Here. Secretary Thal. Here. Secretary Vague. Here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have a quorum? We sure do. Thank you very much, everybody. Our first bit of business is uh, bittersweet for us. Uh, it's to uh, recognize our uh, Deputy Executive Director, Christopher Houston, after uh, oh so many years of service to um, uh, this Commonwealth, including this board. Um, we uh, would like to you know, recognize his service, obviously, as the board and the work he's done. And with that, we do have a uh, commendation, which I want uh, Joe Torta to read to the, uh, for the minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before I read the commendation, uh, you know, we, we read these occasionally and we recognize people that have made a difference. Uh, Chris has really made a difference here. Uh, Chris took us from the, fun from the Funston recommendations to where we are today. Uh, and the, the, the way this board functions and the efficiency uh, in which it does the agency's business and serves the members and participants is, is a tribute to Chris's work. Uh, and he is going to be greatly missed. Uh, with that, uh, I will read the commendation. Work your way up, Chris, while you're reading it. Whereas Christopher C. Houston has served the citizens of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for more than a decade, providing sound leadership and counsel in a number of roles, including the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development, the Office of General Counsel, and most importantly, at the State Employees Retirement System. Whereas Christopher C. Houston has served honorably and with tremendous dedication as a trusted counsel advisor to agency leadership, board members and designees, administration officials, legislative leaders and staff to protect and ensure the needs and interests of the agency and its members and participants. And whereas Christopher C. Houston has also provided sound legal insight and counsel on matters involving a wide range of agency endeavors, including administration, litigation, legislative matters, benefit structure, member appeals, and investment agreements. And whereas Christopher C. Houston, in his most recent role as Deputy Executive Director for Administration and as Acting Chief Compliance Officer, has helped guide the agency's vital and ongoing transition to enhance levels of fiduciary responsibility, accountability, and transparency. And whereas Christopher C. Houston has also helped chart a future course for the agency by facilitating the creation of and regular updates to the SERS 
board governance policy manual as well as played a key role in the development and implementation of the CERN strategic business plan and now therefore the Pennsylvania State Employees Retirement System commends Christopher C. Houston for his dedication to this agency and the approximately 238,000 members and participants we serve and wishes him good health, happiness and success in all of his endeavors. Let me say this. I mean, uh, you know, we did touch upon uh, the governance piece, and it should be Christopher Governance Houston, by the way, <laughs> uh, because uh, when I first came on board as the chairman, uh, it had just started uh, as far as the process going, and oh, so many years uh, it took. Uh, but Chris is the kind of professional that, I mean, dealt with all of the minutiae that goes with that uh, kind of a policy, but made it so, um, I guess, you know, easy for us to understand and for us to make any adjustments to it. And it's so appropriate that today we have finally put the uh, last signature into the governance policy. Uh, and Chris will be leaving uh, this just 17th, right? Is it? Yes, a week from today. week from today. So uh, with that, Chris, I really liked working with you. Wish you the best of luck. And you have the floor, my friend. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So it's been 40 years of uh, work, um, private sector, public sector. And really, uh, working for SERS has been the best. Um, working for the board, working for the excellent staff, and you all do excellent work, and I'm so glad to have been a part of it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with that, we'll go to the uh, regular agenda, the uh, adoption of the agenda, item number three. Uh, a motion is in order to adopt the agenda for the June 10th, 2022 board meeting. Do I hear a motion? So moved. I hear a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. Anyone on the question? Hearing none. All in favor, aye. aye. All opposed, no. Aye. Motion carried. The number four item of the agenda is the approval of the consent calendar. A motion is in order to approve the consent calendar item as listed for the June 10, 2022 board meeting. Do I hear a motion? So moved. I hear a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. I hear a second. Anyone in the question? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Item number five is uh, committee reports, action items. The first one up is uh, the board governance committee which I chair, and which I have to pull it out here. Okay, uh, the Board Governance and Personnel Committee um, met on June 3rd, 2022, 9.30 a.m., um, right here. Uh, attendance was complete uh, with either the uh, board members of the committee or their designees. Um, we went into the SERS fiduciary review and board self-assessment final report implementation of recommendations. And as I indicated, uh, the committee received updates on the recommendation from Funston's final report and were assigned to the committee. The committee removed the legislative positioning and governance structure uh, memo and discussed the recommendations with respect to outstanding categories of recommendations, which included legislative posturing, positioning, um, the governance structure and succession planning. The committee took specific action regarding the succession planning strategy, but under legislative positioning, uh, it was the, the uh, a, a consensus of the committee um, that the um, status quo would remain when it comes to advancing legislation in the legislature. Obviously, um, we would give our, um, as far as any issues that would be uh, uh, problematic, uh, for the SERS board, um, but really we would not take any uh, real pro or con positions on any uh, advancing legislation. Uh, under governance structure, uh, the committee removed the, the attached legislative positioning and governance structure memo uh, and discussed those recommendations from Fun uh, Funston, and they're listed here. Um, but also that's under D, suggested that the SERS staff could provide periodic guidance to appointing authorities with respect to trustee appointments. After discussion of the funds and recommendations, the committee uh, took no action. And that would be uh, any kinds of uh, professional uh, requirements under that, or obviously with some of the diversity that we're uh, continuing to pursue. Um, the next uh, item is succession planning. 
and the committee reviewed a state employees retirement system succession plan memo discussing the proposed succession plan for key SERS leadership positions and recommended to the board that it approved the delegation of authority to the executive director of SERS to develop and implement a SERS succession plan for the key SERS leader positions of executive director Chief Investment Officer, Chief Counsel, Internal Audit Director, Chief Compliance Officer, and Chief Financial Officer. And as you can see, uh, that was unanimous by the board, uh, or by the committee. So with that, I move that the State Employees Retirement Board accept the recommendation of the Board Governance and Personnel Committee to approve the delegation of authority to the Executive Director of SERS, the responsibility of developing and implementing a SERS succession plan for the key SERS leader positions of Executive Director, Chief Investment Officer, Chief Counsel, Internal Audit Director, Chief Compliance Officer, and Chief Financial Officer, which will have the following components with the overarching objective of ensuring that the ongoing daily operations at SERS continues. One, provide clear emergency contingency plans and directions in the event of an unexpected or planned temporary absence of a key SERS leader. Two, develop and proactively plan for a future vacancy and plan departures. And three, include a general recruitment strategy, which is consistent with the agency's commitment to an inclusive and respectful work environment that fosters personal and professional growth, embraces the contributions of all team members, and values diversity in people, ideas, and experiences to achieve our highest potential. It's properly moved. Do I hear a second? Second. I hear a second. Anyone on the question? Anyone on the question? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mr. Becker. Aye. Mr. Erdman for Senator DeSanto. Aye. Chairman Fillman. Aye. Representative Frankel or designee? Uh, Treasury. This is Dan Ocko. Uh, we, if, if, if Representative Frankel's not on the call, it would be aye. Thank you. Treasurer Garrity. Aye. Senator Hughes. Aye. Mr. Jordan. Aye. Representative Schemmel. Aye. Ms. Soderberg. Aye. Secretary Thal. Aye. Secretary Vague. Aye. Uh, this is Alan Flanagan from Secretary. I'm sorry, Secretary, are you on? And the vote? Alan, please go ahead. Aye. Thank you. Unanimous vote. Thank you very much. And finally, the SERS strategic plan. The committee received an update on the fiscal year 2021-2022 strategic goals completion and items that required updated delivery dates and reviewed the FY 2022-2023 strategic goals. After discussion and review of the operational timeline, the committee recommended to the State Employees Retirement Board that approve the SERS strategic plan FY 2021, FY 2023, as located in board docs at agenda item 4B. Uh, the vote was unanimous. Uh, so for the board, I move that the State Employees Retirement Board accept the recommendation of the Board Governance and Personnel Committee to approve the SERS strategic plan FY 2021 to FY 2023 as set forth in the attachment. It's been properly moved. Do I hear a second? Second. I hear a second. Anyone on the question? Anyone on the question? Seeing none, roll call, please. Mr. Becker? Aye. Mr. Erdman for Senator DeSanto? Aye. Chairman Fillman? Aye. Mr. Ocko for Representative Frankel? Aye. Treasurer Garrity? Aye. Senator Hughes? Aye. Mr. Jordan? Aye. Representative Schemmel? Aye. Ms. Soderberg? Aye. Secretary Thal? Aye. Secretary Vagor designee? Aye. Unanimous vote. Thank you very much. And that concludes the uh, report of the Board Governance and Personnel Committee uh, for the June 3rd, 2022 meeting. Going on to 5B, uh, Committee Report Investment Committee Chair Glenn Becker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the June 3 meeting of the Investment Committee was called to order at uh, 1032. We approved the minutes of the April 28 Investment Committee meeting. Uh, Jim Nolan provided a summary of transactions to the public equity and cash components of the defined benefit plan, uh, defined benefit portfolio, uh, to rebalance the asset allocation targets as approved at the May 5 board meeting. 
Uh, Tom Shingler and Britt Murdoch of Callan provided quarterly investment performance analysis as of March 31 for the defined benefit deferred compensation and defined contribution plans. Uh, Matt Roach of Stepstone and Matt Ritter of NEPC provided quarterly investment performance uh, analysis for the private equity and private credit and the real estate components of the portfolios respectively. We then had a presentation from uh, Sentinel Capital Partners for their Fund 7, which will target control investments in middle market buyouts in North America. We are investors in their Fund 5, which has provided uh, favorable, favorable results. And by a vote of seven yes, one, uh, three no, and one absent, we had a recommendation to the board that we make a commitment as follows. I move that the State Employees Retirement Board accept the recommendations of the Investment Committee to commit one, uh, commit up to $100 million to Sentinel Capital Partner 7 LP, and two, commit up to $25 million to Sentinel Junior Capital 2 LP plus investment expenses and pro rata share of partnership operating expenses consistent with executed partnership documents as investments within the private equity asset class subject to successful completion of contract negotiations and execution and delivery of closing documents by all parties, including required Commonwealth legal approvals within 12 months. It has been properly moved. May I have a second, please? Is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, with that, Mr. Uh, committee Chair, uh, I move to postpone indefinitely the recommendation investment committee to one commit to up to $100 million to Sentinel Capital Partners 7 LP and two commit up to $25 million to Sentinel Junior Capital 2 LP. Do I have a second to that motion? Second. I hear a second. Anyone on the question of this motion only? Can I ask the reason for the motion? Excuse me? This is, this is Chuck Erdman for Senator DeSanto. I, I believe that uh, uh, based on some of the issues we've had since the meeting of the, the third, uh, I believe this is the best uh, possible avenue taking with this, uh, this investment. Could I, could I ask what the issues we have since the third vote? I'm, I'm sorry, you're we're having a difficult time hearing what's going on. I, I said, could I, could I understand what you're Yeah, uh, could you mute your mic? Uh, I, we, we can't. Uh... Okay, fine, thank you. I, I believe it's just an issue of what we were discussing when the original, original uh, motion had come up uh, in the committee meeting. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that's that's the path that I think was the best for us to do. Um, so, again, uh, the motion has been properly moved and seconded. Anyone on this motion itself? Yes, Senator. Mr. Chair, Representative. that's all right. Paul is fine. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm actually clear as to, to the reason for the, for the motion. Um, I met uh, yesterday with uh, the Chief Financial Officer and others within the SERS team to discuss my own concerns about private equity. Uh, I think that those concerns on my part were assuaged. I was a no voting committee. Uh, I would be prepared to be a yes vote on this today um, because I do believe it's a prudent investment based upon the fact that we do have a certain uh, certain amount of our investment already invested in private equ in private uh, in private markets. Uh, so, I'm, but I'm not sure if that is it is the objection of the chair or it's not clear to me what the objection or the reason for the motion is. I, I'm, I'm, make, I'm making recommendation of motion to indefinitely postpone the recommendation. Uh, that's how, how you vote on this is, is up to you. Okay, thank you. I, I will be voting against the motion. Okay. And anybody else? Mary? Um, I have a lot of mixed feelings about this. Uh, this company really adds some value to our portfolio. Uh, and I do know that... Um, you know they they're making some internal changes within the company. Is would we come back and visit revisit this proposal, or? Yes. Uh, th that's possible. Uh, the 
if the motion to postpone indefinitely is approved, then the internal investment office, Callan, and the uh, general partner would revisit the situation, uh, would decide if they want to continue to go forward with this, if there's additional information they would want to bring to the board. So it's possible that it could come back to the board at a future occasion. It's also possible that Sentinel may decide they don't want to engage or the investment office upon reconsideration would conclude that this was not the right fit. Um, in addition to postponing indefinitely, you could postpone to a specific date, but then that then puts an artificial deadline for the investment office to make that determination. So a motion to postpone indefinitely gives the investment office and the general partner and the investment consultant the maximum flexibility to revisit the investment and address any concerns that may have come up uh, in the previous discussions. So the short answer is it, it may mean it's it's over, but it does not necessarily mean that. <laughs> Representative Schemmel, hold, hold on a second. Shemmel. Shemmel. Hold on, Schemmel, and then uh, is it Senator Hughes? That's correct. Okay, you're next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that there were concerns in regard to the the responses the Sentinel made uh, with questionnaires regarding their their DEI program, as and specifically regarding uh, mentorship, whether they had a separate mentorship program uh, for individuals that met, you know, minority or woman classifications. My understanding is the Sentinel corrected the record by saying, "Well, we have a mentorship program for all new employees that we do not." we do not distinguish between those that fit any particular category, that all employees are assigned a mentor, including those that are uh, minority or women. Uh, therefore, they would seem to meet the qualifications. Uh, this is a good investment, as I am led to understand. For the good of our annuitants, we should make this investment choice now. Uh, I don't understand why we wouldn't, and I don't understand why a mentorship program that applies to all employees equally is not adequate to satisfy, you know, whatever uh, uh, these qu qualifications the questionnaire might be. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hughes, but l let me say this. I mean, I think the vote in the committee was uh, not unanimous. Uh, so there are issues that were before at least three of the members. Uh, so that's, you know, I think uh, as we go forward to keep that in mind. Senator Hughes? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Let, let me... There clearly is some unreadiness. Uh, I think that um, the chairman's recommendation, the chairman's motion, is the best course of action uh, because, as I hear it, the chairman's motion allows for some unreadiness um, to be addressed. Um, there are, are some outstanding questions that were reflected in the committee vote uh, last week. And as I hear the chairman's motion, um, it allows for some due diligence and some unreadiness to be addressed um, with the possibility uh, of moving forward um, with this potential investment. Um, I think that this would, I would suggest that this would be the best path forward um, with this um, particular uh, potential investment. Uh, and that we clear up some of that unreadiness and some of those issues and then uh, possibly uh, uh, come back to that with a full complement of issues have been addressed and all members ready to uh, vote on um, their consciousness and vote their perspective uh, on um, the issues as have been fully addressed. I think this may be the best course of action as opposed to um, something otherwise. Thank you, uh, Senator. Committee Chair Becker. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, would, my, I would just say that we did go back to them. We had some uh, issues, concerns were raised. And before we went to vote at the uh, committee meeting, we did have those addressed. Um, and, uh, may, and to my satisfaction, but possibly not to everyone's satisfaction, but we did have uh, issues addressed. Uh, they also have gone uh, and added a a person to a very at a very high level uh, partner partner level to address uh, issues of uh, DEI. 
and uh, to improve their record there. So from my perspective, they've, they've done uh, what, they've addressed the concerns that we have expressed. And my concern is if we um, delay this indefinitely, uh, then we will, will, we have a good chance of missing out on this. I, th I believe, and correct me, investment office if I'm wrong, but I think it's a, tw a July 11 or 12 close date, something something like that. So we don't have a whole a lot of time uh, on this. So from my perspective, they've addressed the issues and and uh, or have made a real effort to to improve the record. Thank you, Representative Schramm. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I was one of the three no votes on this. As I stated, my no vote was based upon my concerns on risk analysis with private equity markets. Those concerns have been assuaged. From what I understand, the motion really revolves around our unacceptance of the DEI policy at this particular firm because their policy provides mentors to all employees and does not specify that it would only be a certain classification of employees. Are we asking them to do something? Are we asking them to no longer provide mentors for some of their employees so that it then appears as though they apply mentors for only you know those minority or women classifications? I, I could be unclear, but if that's what we're voting to do, I think this board is going beyond the scope of what we should. Our job is solely to return good investment for the annuitants of the SERS, uh, SERS annuitants. Now we're making policy decisions to not invest in what otherwise should be a smart investment because we don't accept a DEI policy that actually does seem, appears, to meet the qualifications of our consulting firm. Once again, Mr. Chair, I will be a no on the motion. I believe that we are missing an opportunity, and I believe the board is going beyond the scope of what is authorized for it under the legislation uh, that forms this board approved by the legislature. Thank you. Mr. Let Chairman, me. please. Mr. Chairman, please. Uh, uh, Senator, I, I, hold on, Senator. Uh, uh, we have some ups in the, in the queue here, and we'll come back to you. I see the Treasurer has her hand up, and, and Don Ocko has. Well, no, I'm going to go to the, the Treasurer, Senator Hughes, and Dan Ocko. Go ahead, Treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is, if we postpone it for one month, do we lose the opportunity? Do you know uh, Chairman Becker? Or Jim? Um, my understanding, and, and Jim Nolan, if you're wrong, please correct me. I, my understanding is that this, the... Um, this uh, deal closes on July 11th or 12th, which yes, will be before our next um, board meeting or investment committee meeting. Yes, that's correct, which is why it was brought to this board meeting as opposed to one later in the year where we would have had more time to do an additional due diligence if we had the option. But again, based on that closing in July, that is correct, Mr. Becker. You can't go back and ask them for an extension? Uh, they have made commitments with all the other LPs, and uh, that would cause a lot of uh, concern with the others. Uh, it would be a big process. Certainly could ask, but um, unusual to do that. Yeah. And before Senator Hughes gets the floor, let me just, the procedure will be, we're going to vote on this motion here. If this motion goes down, it goes to the original motion, and then it would be a roll call vote on both of those motions as we go forward. So just so you understand, if it goes down under the original motion, there is no going back. We have it indefinitely postponed in this motion where it's still on the table in a sense uh, for a possible review in the future if necessary. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and, and let me just, if I could, um, first of all, DEI is important, and it certainly is important, I'm sure, to an overwhelming number of the uh, the participants um, in, in, in SERS. Secondly, secondly, what the, their, what the chairman has recommended is a postponement to allow certain of the issues that have been raised, and there still remains unreadiness amongst a number of board members, uh, but not an unwillingness to consider. Uh, now, now, it, it, DEI was one of the issues, and I didn't necessarily want to go down this path, but there was some veracity issues as well. However, I'm keeping uh, my mind open, uh, and I would encourage um, encourage the members um, to to work with this motion 
to allow these matters to get uh, resolved so that this organization uh, could very possibly have a unanimous vote on making this investment uh, as long as those um, issues are resolved. Um, having had conversations with the chairman over the last several days and other and Mr. Nolan, Mr. Torta and others um, over the last several days, um, I think that this is, from my understanding, this is something that wants to get looked at, wants to get addressed sooner rather than later. Um, mm. And so I mm. would just recommend um, that uh, we follow the chairman's lead, um, ask for a postponement, allow a greater clarity um, on the issues that were concerned, and, and hopefully the unreadiness that some of us have um, can get addressed. And that's what I would recommend, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave my comments at that. Thank you, Senator. Dan Ocko. Um, I, I don't believe Representative Frankel's on the line. And I'll just, uh, first of all, I want to compliment uh, both Chair Philman and Senator Hughes. Uh, I, I absolutely understand the, the perspectives of the, the other members of the board. I think what is impressive about this board is we've done deals with the same companies in the past, and we've always tried to get a better deal or work with partners, even if we've had past arrangements, either to get better returns or better arrangements. And so we've had a process of, of always trying to do better. And so I absolutely appreciate the opportunity that Chairman Philman is trying to do to give us an opportunity to do better. Um, I think the concerns addressed, the concerns that were stated at last meeting, I'm not going over them, do involve much more than one checkbox. Okay, so it's not just an issue of whether they checked one box yes when they meant no and, and, and what the significance of that is. There, there, there were additional issues. I think there are additional opportunities. And, and again, I, I've not consulted with Chairman Philman on his idea. This wasn't my suggestion, but, but I, I think this is an opportunity to try to resolve concerns. And I appreciate uh, Chairman Philman's uh, willingness to try to do this that could potentially be a win-win. Um, so, and as I said, it goes beyond a single checkbox. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Treasurer. Chairman, uh, Tom Sengler. Oh, Treasurer, uh, Treasurer. I'm just wondering, um, and I appreciate your efforts to resolve this, uh, Chairman Philman, but um, could we have a special meeting prior to the July 12th closing um, to permit time to resolve board hes hesitancy? Uh, I'm indicating from legal it's possible. Go ahead. Uh, yes, that, that can be done. Uh, we need enough time to sunshine and everything, but yes, that is possible. Chairman Fulman? Yes. This is Tom Schindler. I did want to clarify, it was mentioned that Cal is consultant for this, and we're not the private equity consultant. Hold on, hold on, so, hold on, stop, stop. You're, you're, yeah, Callan's correct, I misspoke. It's, it's not yeah. Callan, it's Stepstone okay. on this. My my apologies, uh, Tom, I was getting my career investments confused. Okay, that's it? Okay, with that, uh, roll call vote. Okay. Now, again, the 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 vote is if you're in favor of the postponement, say aye. Okay, Mr. Becker. And uh, no. Mr. Erdman for Senator DeSanto. No. Chairman Filman. Aye. Mr. Rocco. Aye. Treasurer Garrity. Um, no, but I would be in favor if we could um, postpone it until, you know, sometime before July 12th. Senator Hughes. Aye. Mr. Jordan. No. Representative Schemmel. No. Ms. Soderbergh. I but like the treasurer, we need to move forward and resolve whatever issues remain and try to get come back again in the next two weeks. But I'm an I. Secretary Vague or designee?
sorry, this is Alan Flanagan. Uh, I would express the same sentiment of the treasurer and Mary uh, with a yes vote at the table. Yes. Uh, but uh, I'd like to see it brought back and reconsidered before the closing date. Thank you. My apologies. I went out of order. Secretary Thal? Aye. 6-5. Six, 6-5 five. Six, five for yes. Table. 6-5, uh, the, the vote it passes. The motion passes uh, to indefinitely uh, postpone. Uh, but obviously I've taken in consideration the comments of the board uh, to take a look at this and how we can possibly resolve the issues that are before us uh, as we go forward. So thank you very much. Uh, Committee Chair uh, Becker, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, we then had a, uh, next we had a presentation from Veritas Capital uh, for their Fund 8, which will target investments in technology and technology-enabled solutions uh, to highly regulated or uh, sectors related to the U.S. government, primarily in North uh, America. By a vote of nine yes and one no, one absent, we had a recommendation, recommendation to the board that we make a commitment as follows. I move that the State Employees Retirement Board accept the recommendation of the Investment Committee to commit one up to $100 million to the Veritas Capital Fund 8 LP and to two up to $25 million to a sidecar vehicle that will co-invest alongside the Veritas Capital Fund 8 plus investment expenses and pro rata share of partnership operating expenses consistent with executed partnership documents as investments within the private equity asset class subject to successful completion of contract negotiations and execution and delivery of closing documents by all parties, including required Commonwealth legal approvals within 12 months. It's been property moved or here a second. Second. I hear a second. second. Anyone on the question? Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This will be much quicker. I was the no voting committee, and uh, as, as with the previous uh, question, um, after a consultation with uh, staff at SERS, I'm satisfied uh, in this investment, so I will be yes. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, roll call, please. Chairman Becker. Aye. Mr. Urban for Senator DeSanto. Aye. Chairman Filman? Aye. Mr. Rocco? Aye. Treasurer Garrity? Aye. Senator Hughes? Aye. Mr. Jordan? Aye. Representative Schemmel? Aye. Ms. Soderberg? Aye. Secretary Thal? Aye. Mr. Flanagan for Secretary Vague? Thank you. Unanimous vote. Right, Come thank here. You. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, we had a presentation from Blackstone Real Estate Partners for their Fund 10, an opportunistic real estate strategy seeking to acquire unmanaged, or excuse me, undermanaged, uh, well-located assets globally across all real estate sectors with a focus on private uh, markets. Uh, by a vote of 10 yes, one absent, uh, we had a recommendation to the board that we make a commitment as follows. I move that the State Employees Retirement Board accept the recommendation of the Investment Committee to commit up to $75 million to Blackstone Real Estate Partners 10 LP plus investment expenses and pro rata share of partnership operating expenses consistent with executed partnership documents as an investment within the real estate asset class subject to successful completion of contract uh, negotiations and execution and delivery of closing documents by all parties, including required Commonwealth legal approvals within 12 months. It's been properly moved. Do I hear a second? Second. I hear a second. Anyone on the question? Anyone on the question? Hearing none, roll call, please. Chairman Becker? Aye. Mr. Erdman for Senator DeSanto? Aye. Chairman Filman? Aye. Mr. Rocco for Representative Frankel? Mr. Rocco? We'll come back to Mr. Rocco. Treasurer Garrity? Aye. Senator aye. Hughes? Aye. Mr. Rocco, was that an aye? Yes. Thank aye. you. 
Did we get Senator Hughes? Yes, you did. Aye. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Jordan? Aye. Representative Schemmel? Aye. Ms. Soderberg? Aye. Secretary Thal? Aye. Mr. Flanagan for Secretary Vague? Aye. Thank you. Unanimous vote. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, for our, our final piece of new business, uh, Jim Nolan provided a sample of SERS consultant and service provider deliverables that the office, that the investment office staff track uh, regularly to ensure expectations are properly met. And uh, that's the end of our new business. Our meeting was adjourned at 1.05, and uh, that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Chair Becker. Uh, with that, we'll go to 5C, Audit Risk and Compliance. Treasurer Garrity, Committee Chair. Thank you. So the Audit Risk and Compliance Committee met on June 3rd at 1.20 p.m. Um, we approved the meeting minutes of the prior meeting of February 25th, 2022. There was no old business. There were no special presentations. Uh, the new business was a review of a board consultant evaluation procedures, basically the assessment of SERS independent auditor. So Ms. Lynn reviewed a recommendation originating from a Funston advisory review for board member board committees, excuse me, to evaluate consultants and advisors under their oversight effective in calendar year 2023. Um, internal audit staff currently close, closely monitors the annual independent audit and auditor through a variety of methods and have drafted an evaluation checklist for the committee's review. And that would be at the February 23 meeting. Um, she also prevented, presented a, a series of next steps to accomplish the evaluation in 2023. We then went into executive, executive session, um, and that was to review and discuss committee business. Um, well, you know from uh, Chris. But basically, the topics that we covered, we had the results of the 2021 independent audit, which was presented by KPMG. Um, we did have an update from the uh, Chief Information Security Officer, and that included cyber. We did have an update from the Chief Compliance Officer, and that was for the quarter ending March 31st, 2022. We had a review of due diligence performed on board approved investments for the period February 2022. And then um, we talked about an internal audit office charter, and that was really just an inf informational item for future discussion. Um, in addition, uh, Jim Nolan was uh, kind enough pr to provide an update on Callan's efforts to implement a second verification of SIRS investment performance calculations and revisions to the quarterly performance report with landscaping upgrades. Now, now this item wasn't originally listed on the agenda, and it really came up as a result of the investment office staff updating the committee members on their follow-up to an internal audit recommendation discussed at the February 25th, 2022 meeting, and they had asked us to take a look at it. So then um, the committee then returned to public session, and um, I made the following motion. Well, I won't read the motion, but I made a motion for the committee to basically approve the, um, the KPMG internal audit statements and um, if I could, I would like to make that motion Go ahead. Now to the board. So I move that the State Employees Retirement Board accept the recommendation of the Audit Risk and Compliance Committee's recommendation to approve, one, the audited 2021 financial statements with required supplementary information with the independent auditor's report for fiscal years ended December 31st, 2021 and 2020 of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania State Employees Retirement System for the Defined Benefit Plan and the State Employees Defined Contribution Plan. And then second, the audited 2021 financial statements with required supplementary information with independent auditor's report for fiscal years ended December 31st, 2021 and 2020 of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Deferred Compensation Plan as presented by our independent auditors, KPMG. It's been properly moved to a here second. Second. I hear second. a second. Anyone on the question? Anyone on the question? Seeing none, roll call, please. Mr. Becker. Aye. Mr. Erdman for Senator DeSanto. Aye. Chairman Philman. Aye. Mr. Ocko for Representative Frankel. Aye. Treasurer Garrity. Aye. Senator Hughes. Aye. Mr. Jordan. Aye. Representative Schemmel. Aye. Ms. Soderberg. Aye. Secretary Thal. Aye. Mr. Flanagan for Secretary Vague. Aye. Thank you. Unanimous vote. Thank you. Committee report. 
Okay, thank you. So as during the cyber update discussion, we did have some next steps because there were questions that were posed by the committee as to whether there were any other pension systems have experienced cyber attacks, um, as well as what Commonwealth agencies are currently doing about carrying cyber insurance. So these questions weren't follow up by CERS. A CISO. Um, and then I also mentioned that at the next meeting, which is uh, in September, um, we are going to talk about SIRS efforts to date on preparations for the upcoming SOC audit as well as next step. So that'll, um, that'll be, you know, to be continued. So that being said, that concluded the report. We adjourned at 2222, and that concludes the Audit Risk and Compliance Committee report. From Thank, June you 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. Finance and Member and Participation Services, Committee Chair Soderberg. Good morning. The Finance and Member and Participant Services Committee met last Friday, June 3rd at 2.38 p.m. The first item of business was to approve the minutes of the April 28th meeting. We then had a presentation by our by Corn Ferry, our actuary, and by our uh, Callan Associates, who are, is our investment co consultant. They gave presentations surrounding the topic of the assumed rate of, re of investment return actuarial assumption and its relationship to capital market expectations. The whole point of the presentation was to um, educate the committee so that we could make um, a decision on the upcoming December 31st, 2022 valuation. So our actuary presented three potential assumptions at, along with corresponding impacts on plan funding and projected future employer contributions. And I want to just say that the entire presentations for Corn Ferry and Callan are attached to board docs along with the complete um, report here. The committee um, and other board members and designees discussed and deliberated the topic, and the committee unanimously passed a motion to recommend that the board lower the annual assumed rate of investment return to 6.875% for the December 31st, 2022 evaluation. Um, excuse me, evaluation, not evaluation. Um, with that, sir, I'd like to offer a motion. Go ahead. I move that the State Employees Retirement Board accept the recommendations of the Finance and Member and Participant Services Committee to, one, lower the current annual assumed rate of investment return to 6.875% compounded annually, and two, keep unchanged the annual assumed rate of inflation of 2.5% compounded annually, with both assumptions to be effective with the December 31st, 2022 actuarial valuation and remain in effect until further action by the board. Been properly moved. I hear a second. Second. I hear a second. Anyone on the question? Anyone on the question? Seeing on roll call, please. Mr. Becker. Aye. Mr. Erdman for Senator DeSanto. Aye. Chairman Fillman. Aye. Mr. Ocko for Representative Frankel. Aye. Treasurer Garrity? Aye. Senator Hughes? Aye. Mr. Jordan? Aye. Representative Schemmel? Aye. Chair Soderberg? Aye. Secretary Thal? Aye. Mr. Flanagan for Secretary Vague? Aye. Thank you. Unanimous vote. Okay, thank you. Committee report. Th thank you. I've got a few more items to review. Um, then our Chief Financial Officer, Sarah McSurdy, spoke about the plans for board consultants. And this, um, this will, the summary laid out the expectations for our actuary and for our third party administrator, Empower, that they, the expectations are established at the beginning of each year and that staff will monitor the relationship through the year and then provide a performance evaluation report at the end of the year. Uh, Ms. McSurdy then presented key financial highlights from the December 31st, 2021 year and financial statements for the defined contribution plan, defined contribution plan, excuse me, defined benefit plan, defined contribution plan, and the deferred compensation plan. Uh, she reviewed contributions, investments, and benefit payments from the plan. And she made a point of 
expressing appreciation to her entire staff for all the work that goes into completing these financial statements and audits for the three plans. And I would just like to add my appreciation as well. It's um, a lot of work goes on behind the scenes for this operation, and um, it's, it's very much appreciated. So thank you, Sarah. Uh, Director, Executive Director Joe Torta reviewed some highlights of the 2021 actuarial report for the defined benefit plan and the benefit completion plan that was produced by Corn Ferry. And then finally, Mr. Torta announced that Brenda Cunard has been selected to fill his old vacancy as the Deputy Executive Director of Member and Participant Services. So we will welcome Ms. Cunard, um, effective July 2nd, 2022. Um, finally, we had tentatively uh, scheduled a meet, our next meeting for July 18th this summer, but my understanding is that most likely we will not be having another um, uh, finance and member and participant services meeting in July. So that concludes my report, sir. Thank you very much. I, I do want to just address the, under the board governance and personnel that Cindy Collins will be taking over uh, for Chris Houston uh, and the position of uh, the lead staff for uh, our assistant. So thank you, Cindy. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, there is no old business. There is no new business. Number eight, a special presentation. We have an education session, 30 minutes uh, from Callan. Who's doing this, Jim? Was he, he's just going to get it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Tom Shingler is going to uh, enlighten the board with uh, a deeper dive into the performance and the state of the capital markets. Um, including geopolitical factors, uh, inflation, interest rates, and all the things that are out there causing the volatility that we're all experiencing. So uh, with that, if uh, Tom Shingler could take over the screen here, and Mike, uh, appreciate it. Hello? Tom, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I just got removed from the meeting. So, uh, Thank you, Tom. Take it away, please. Okay. Could uh, you please pull up the document? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to cover the markets from the perspective of the public markets, so focus on the public markets, what's going on. I'm going to cover the economy and inflation particularly. So from a Cal perspective, we do work with SERS on the public markets, and we also work on strategic planning projects like asset allocation. And we are in the process of doing an asset liability study with SERS that includes all asset classes. So it's important to keep that in mind in listening to these remarks because the asset allocation of SERS does include private markets as well, and that diversification has helped SERS. So, for instance, if we look at the first quarter of this year, diversification into private markets was additive to performance, areas like private equity, private credit, and real estate. So when we do the asset liability study, which I believe we'll present in September, that is going to incorporate all asset classes. My focus today is on the economy, on inflation, and on what's going on in public markets. So if we can turn to the next slide, please. Uh, one more, please. So from an economic perspective, what's happening, there are four charts here on, on GDP growth, on inflation, the yield curve, and the difference between tips and treasury, so what's called the break-even to assess forward-looking in inflation. And the high level is that we've had a very strong recovery coming out of COVID and then a dip to negative GDP, GDP growth in the first quarter. Inflation has spiked up. I'll talk more about that. So the reading as of this morning was 8.6% for inflation in the United States. 
And we've also seen in this environment a rise in interest rates. So interest rates have spiked up and that's had a negative impact on markets so far this year. And then if we look out further from an inflationary perspective, the markets are still predicting inflation of two and a half, three percent if we look out 10 years from now. So the, over the long term inflation picture remains more benign, but the short term inflation picture is much more punitive. So if we can move to the next slide, please. A little bit more on GDP growth. So typically in recessions, the recovery out of negative GDP growth takes longer. So if you think back to the global financial crisis, for instance, the recovery coming out of that took longer than it did out of COVID. And we're already back above uh, GDP levels from pre-COVID. GDP did drop slightly in the first quarter of this year. It was down about a percent and a half but we have had a very strong recovery already coming out of COVID. Next slide, please. So when we think about what's happening economically, one aspect that was a surprise earlier this year that has been negative from an economic perspective and from an inflationary perspective is Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We have a number of charts on this that I'm not going to go through, but they they do go into detail on where the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is most severe. So those are Eastern European and Central Asian countries that have the highest degree of interaction with Russia, where they're either importing or exporting from Russia, where they rely on Russian tourism, investment from Russia. They're getting remitt remittances where foreign employees are working in Russia and then sending money home to their countries in Eastern Europe or Central Asia. So those are the countries that have been the hardest hit in terms of the economic impact. But the Im economic impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is much broader because it has a severe impact on energy in terms of supply of energy. They're one of the largest energy suppliers in the world and, and on energy prices. It also has significant ge geopolitical impacts where countries that, like European countries that were relying on, on Russia for energy are now having to try to pivot to find other energy sources. It also has a severe impact on food prices. So Russia and Ukraine being large suppliers of agricultural products like grains, uh, such as wheat, that is having a significant impact on uh, food prices. And it could be very, uh, very impactful on some parts of the world like Africa that rely on, on food from Russia and Ukraine. So the impacts are broad from that perspective. And also just when you have this higher risk geopolitical environment where Russia's invasion of Ukraine could potentially broaden to a broader conflict, that also is negative for markets. It's, uh, it's negative for growth. The World Bank's release from this week is now GDP growth globally going from their projection of 4.1% this year to 2.9. So we're definitely in a period where the expectation for growth is now lower. If we can go uh, to slide nine please thank you uh just one back yeah. so yeah one back nine yeah so there's information here that gives details of different conflicts and what their impact has been on markets and it's important to have that context where generally the impact of conflicts in the near terms on equity terms is negative, but it's more muted than you might think. If you look at these S&P 500 to worst, so what the trough decline is, they tend to be relatively muted for all these different conflicts that we're looking at in history. So while the humanitarian crisis is severe, the atrocities are terrible to, to, to read about and witness if you're watching on television, in terms of the actual market's impacts, they tend to be relatively muted when we look at history for the impact of uh, on equity returns. If we can go on from here to uh, slide 11, please. So two ahead. Thank you. So I'm going to get more into inflation here. And again, we just got another reading today that was very high for inflation. And it's important to understand that this inflationary rise that we're seeing is relatively broad based. So 
This is not confined to one sector of the economy. There are areas that are getting a lot of press coverage. So transportation, that has had the highest rate of inflation. You can see that on this slide. We break down all the primary categories that go into the measurement of inflation. And transportation has been the highest source of inflation. So one area that's gotten a lot of coverage is the price of cars. So the price of both new and used cars. And there's a number of reasons for that. But if you've had to try and buy, let's say, a used car in the last year or two, it's been a very challenging experience and very expensive. And you can see that in these numbers. So transportation costs, which also include costs like gas prices, that's up over 22% for the last year for this, this measurement period. But it's more broad based than that. So other areas like uh, food. So if you're going to the grocery store, I think we all see it that the food prices are up. The latest reading has food prices up 10% year over year and housing uh, is also up a lot year over year. So there's a number of areas where we're seeing high inflation. It's not confined to just one area of the economy. And everyone has their own consumption basket for inflation. So someone may be a renter and they're subject to rent increases versus someone who let's say has a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. They're not necessarily gonna see that inflationary pressure on housing. Everyone's gonna see it on food. Everyone's going to see it on transportation, but if you're buying a car or not, that also is going to impact it. So what we what we can see is that when we have very high inflation, it can start to alter consumer behavior. We are seeing that in some areas where people start to change their behaviors to save money and, and, and deal with rising costs. The other aspect is how much companies can pass through these costs to consumers. So Longer term, equity securities can be a source of inflation hedging because companies try and price in rising costs to consumers. But their ability to do that is also being challenged. So if you think about retailers, for instance, how much are they able to pass on these costs to consumers without consumers changing their behavior? And then one last comment here is that with inflation, this tends to be a, what we call an aggressive tax. So if you're a low income person, a middle income person, inflation is more severe for you because and when we think about the denominator of how much disposable income someone has, higher food prices, transportation costs, that has more impact on them because it's a, it's a larger piece of their pie. So from that perspective, it is a, it is a regressive tax and the Federal Reserve in particular is very focused on trying to bring down inflation. They certainly misread inflation. They, there was the term that was used, I'm sure folks have heard it was transitory, and that that has not been the case. The idea that this was going to pass quickly, uh, inflation has been much more sustained than originally anticipated, and now the Fed's trying to bring it down. So if we can go to page 14. Thank you. Yeah, so this slide, so there's only so much the Fed can do to try and fight inflation. One of their main tools is interest rates. So if we look at this chart, this is looking at the federal funds effective rate. So the, the Fed funds lending rate versus consumer price index. And this is going back um, far in history to show, to show trend. And what you'll see is that generally speaking, not always, but the Fed funds rate has typically been above the rate of inflation. So now we're in a period where that's not the case and it's very far from it. So CPI is now 8.6%, the Fed funds rate is 0.83%. So there's a huge dispersion between where the Fed funds rate is uh, very low and where inflation is up here. And so what the Federal Reserve is trying to do is bring inflation down by raising interest rates in part. There are other tools they can use like what we call quantitative tightening where they're trying to reduce their balance sheet. Uh, and that also helps bring up interest rates on securities and, and will have a, hopefully a, an impact on inflation. But the Fed wants to do this in what's called a soft landing, where they do this without causing a recession. That is extremely challenging to do. So if you raise borrowing costs, for instance, let's take housing, a 30 year mortgage today nationally is about 5.5%. If we go back to late last year, it was below 3%. So the costs of borrowing to, let's say, buy a house are up a lot. So when you start to do things like raise interest rates, 
that does have a flow through to the economy. Credit is harder to access, and that slows down the economy. So the, the Fed is trying to thread that needle where they bring down inflation, but do it, do it without causing a recession. If we go uh, three slides ahead, I'm sorry, to 21, please. I'm going to go to 21 in the interest of time. So that's a, a backdrop on the economy and on inflation. I do want to focus on, on public markets, so stock and bond markets, what, what's happening there, and, and the relationship with inflation. And then I'll, I'll see if there's any questions. So from a stock market perspective, in the U.S., we have been in a very strong period for returns, particularly large cap stocks. So this is a histogram of all these different returns annually for the S&P 500. And you can see for five years, 10 years, returns for stocks have been extremely strong. So the S&P 500 for five years uh, ended at the end of last year was up over 18% annualized, 10 years over 16%. And we also show the annual returns here. And generally speaking, returns have been very strong. That hasn't been the case year to date. So stocks are down over 10% year to date. And then stocks that are more interest rate sensitive, where uh, the discounting is now more severe with interest rates going up, those have been some of the most hard hit areas of stocks. So if we take, for instance, the NASDAQ index year to date, that index is in a bear market. Uh, NASDAQ stocks are down well over 20%. Other areas of the market have done better, and I'll get into that. But it is important to keep in mind that we have been in this period of very strong returns for equities. That has helped SERS's performance. It's been a major contributor to performance and to increasing the funded status of the plan. If we go uh, ahead one slide, please. So this has a lot of information on different parts of the U.S. equity market and performance. There are two key high-level takeaways here. One is that value-oriented parts of the market, particularly energy stocks with the surge in energy prices, have done the best, and growth markets have done much worse. And that's why it's important from a surge perspective to have broad diversification in, in equities, which you do. And you're getting the benefit in terms of having broad exposure as opposed to just having a tilt to one area like tech stocks, uh, having broad exposure where those areas have done worse this year and, and, and having exposure to the other areas that have done better, notably energy. So this is through the end of March, but if we go through uh, this week, energy stocks are up over 60% this year. They're the only part of the market that is positive year to date besides utilities. Every other part of the market has had a negative return. And that's why it is important to have this broad exposure rather than simply trying to time or tilt to a part of the market, keeping broad exposure so that you're getting that benefit when you're, when you're having decline in, in other parts of the market. So energy has been by far the best performing part of the, the equity market. Uh, if we go ahead one slide, please. Uh, this is showing what's happened in terms of uh, the equity rise over time and price appreciation. The key takeaway here is that relative to history, equities in the U.S. are still above average on price. So if you look at the 25-year average of the S&P, PE, it's 16.8. Uh, right now, we're at around 18 or so. So equity valuations have come down with the decline, but we're still actually, from a valuation perspective, we're still above uh, historical averages for equities. And then uh, if we can go to uh, the next slide, please. This is showing this in more detail. So you can see the 25-year average. And so what's the takeaway here is that, yes, equities have sold off. As this is through the end of March, and, and they're down further from, from the end of March. But they can go further. So we've had periods where equities prices have gone down 50%. Uh, they're nowhere near that today. But it's important to understand that if you look at this, for a PE ratio, and today we're around 18 versus a 25-year average of 16.8. That even just to get to average, we could see to, we could see declines. So it, we want to have that mindset of we're long-term investors. We're not trying to time markets. We continue to invest. If any new dollars that are going in today are going in at a more attractive price point than they were uh, even at the beginning of this year, 
but that equities could fall further. And, and that, I'm saying that partly based on the, what we see from a historical valuation perspective. Uh, if we can move ahead two slides. Thank you. So this is uh, the last slide I'll cover on, on equities. This is getting into non-U.S. equities, and it's, it's very similar in terms of returns, so down uh, about 11% year-to-date. Uh, this is through the end of March, and similar to the U.S., markets were down 5 6%, broadly speaking, for non-U.S. markets, so developed and emerging markets. There was significant dispersion in different parts of the market where the value-oriented sectors in general did better, like energy, materials, and financials, and the growth sectors, like consumer di discretionary information technology, did worse. So it's very similar to what we've seen in the United States. The one exception is that Russia was a big part of energy uh, in emerging markets, and Russia being removed from the index, if you recall from past meetings, Russia has been removed from stock market indices, uh, whether it's the ones that it combined developed in emerging markets or just emerging markets, they're now out of those indices. So they don't, they're not, they're not part of the, the, the index pricing, but they were in the first quarter and they did uh, drive energy down because they were written down to zero. But overall, those value sectors are doing better. It's very similar to the United States. The area that has a really had poor performance and is very important from an economic and markets perspective is China. So China is about a third of the emerging markets index. Uh, they're economically one of the two most important economies in the world with the United States. The return you can see for Q1 was 14%. What China's done has been very conservative on COVID. You may have heard about their zero COVID policy uh, where they're locking down cities and that's very negative for growth. They already had a low growth expectation for this year, uh, lowest in over 25 years. And now that's going to be lower because they've had this zero COVID policy. So that is also negative for growth globally because China is such a large driver of economic growth. So that's the story from an equity perspective. And then I'm going to go to the, the fixed income portion. So if we can go to... This would be 20, uh, 29, please. Thank you. So fixed income, fixed income has also had negative performance. So it's not just equities, and that's due to rising interest rates and to uh, spread widening, mainly due to uh, rising interest rates, though. And there are a lot of numbers on this page, but I'll, I'll point you to two to, to help tell the story. So the Bloomberg aggregate, that's broad U.S. investment grade bonds, and they were down almost 6% in Q1. It was the worst quarter for the Bloomberg aggregate since 1980. So there's bad news from that perspective, and I'll get into the good news from that in a moment. And areas of the market that were more interest rate sensitive, so longer term bonds, like long government credit, did even worse. So you can see that on this chart. The Bloomberg long government credit was down 11% in Q1. And actually, year-to-date, it's now down about 20%. So the long bond part of the market has done the worst as interest rates have risen. If we go one chart ahead, please, this puts it in historical perspective. So looking at maximum drawdowns for the Bloomberg aggregate, this tends to be a very low volatility index. Generally speaking, returns on an annual basis are positive for bonds. So this, is an, this period is an aberration in terms of the returns being so negative. You can see that the drawdown is the worst uh, since 1980, and it's the third worst loss since the inception of the index. So the, the returns were poor, but the, the positive to this is that it does mean that on a go-forward basis, we have higher yields to, to invest in. So in dollars that are reinvested are being invested, reinvested at higher yields than they were very recently. So that's a positive in terms of forward-looking returns. And the other aspect of it is that what we call the, the diversification cost, so having bonds in the portfolio, 
they're not expected to return as much as stocks. So there is a cost in terms of holding bonds, generally speaking, them providing downside protection. So the cost of that diversification is now lower because of uh, interest rates having gone up and yields having risen. So there are positives to it, but certainly in, in the first quarter, the, the returns were negative and among the worst in the history of the index, which dates to 1976. So if we go, we go a couple slides ahead to 33, please. I want to cover correlations because this is an aspect that I think is surprising to some folks. We wrote a blog post on this that I can share where the idea that if stocks go down, shouldn't bonds go up? There's generally that idea. And if you actually have that perfect negative correlation relationship, so uh, a negative one correlation where one being uh, perfectly correlated versus negative one not being uh, correlated where one, one goes up and one goes down, that's not actually the case for stocks and bonds. So the, the correlation over time is actually cl much closer to zero. So that means that it doesn't tell you whether or not uh, bonds are going to be up or down when, when stocks are up or down. So it's not, it's not a perfect negative correlation. There are periods, it's about 10% of quarters in history, we looked back uh, long in history to show that there are about 10% of quarters when both have been down. So this does happen, but it is unusual. We, it's not something that we expect to happen typically, but it does happen. And the part of the bond market that typically has the lowest correlation to stocks is treasuries. And SERS has a dedicated allocation to treasuries for that reason. So it gives you a source of liquidity and it gives you a good source of diversification, generally speaking, to stocks. And we see that in this chart where we're looking at the rolling three-year correlation of treasuries, of the aggregate, and of high yield to stocks. And we're looking at that uh, through time to show over 30 years. And you can see on the bottom here, treasuries have the lowest correlation, negative 0.19. Bloomberg aggregate is around 0, 0, 0.04, and high yield, which is much more equity-like type of fixed income, gives you much less diversification. You can see a 0.64 correlation. So what we saw was unusual, and we tend to see it more when rates, interest rates are rising, that stocks and bonds both fall. But uh, generally speaking, we do get a diversification benefit from treasuries in particular and from investment-grade bonds as well. So those are reasons that we want to have them in the portfolio, even though in this period of time, they did not provide uh, diversification benefit. And then the last slide I'll cover to <laughs> end on a positive note after a lot of more uh, sober, sober remarks is that you can see here, we've been in a period where duration, so the interest rate sensitivity of investment grade bonds has been ex extending. So higher duration, meaning more sensitive to changes in prices um, when you would see interest rates go uh, up or down. So more, 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 more price sensitivity from a change in interest rates. So we have seen that extend along with yields being very low. Now what we are starting to see is a little bit of tick down in duration, but more importantly, yields coming back up. So from a forward-looking perspective, that is a positive to see the, the yields going up. And the, that means that for reinvestment, for rebalancing when new dollars are going in, that, that investments are being made at higher yields. So I'll stop there and see if there's any comments or questions. My intent was to give an overview from an economic perspective, from an inflationary perspective, and uh, on the public markets. Thanks, Tom. It was very well. Was very Any well. questions for Tom? Questions comments? For Tom comments. Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Okay. And on time too. That's good. Um, item number nine: reports of executive, the executive director and senior staff. Executive director Torta. Thanks, Chairman Philman. Uh, I have a few things to present today. First, my administrative update, which you can find in tab 9, small letter A, small letter I, in board docs. 
Um, my meetings with stakeholders continued, uh, myself as well as other SERS staff at the time of, the, uh, of this memo. Uh, the meetings were scheduled. Those meetings did take place. Uh, met with uh, House Democratic Leader Joanna McClinton. Uh, on May 23rd, I met with uh, Senate Democratic Leader Jay Costa and uh, House Democratic Appropriations Chair Matt Bradford. Uh, those meetings went very well. Uh, stakeholder meetings will continue on an as-needed basis. Again, uh, just continuing to build relationships with the powers that be. We've been treated and received very well uh, by both chambers and all of the key stakeholders. Um, diversity initiative. We've continued discussions with uh, Senator Hughes and, and his staff regarding this initiative. Again, it's very important to us. Uh, I do want to thank Senator Hughes for taking the lead on this, and the direction that your staff has given us has been very beneficial. Uh, from the standpoint of personnel, normally this is where I talk about uh, how limited we are and how many vacancies we have. I'm going to do that again a little bit, but I have some good news. Um, right now we have 56 vacancies. At SERS, still over 20%. But I get this vacancy report every week, and this is the first time where I've seen the pendulum start to swing in the other direction. By my math, uh, in the next five weeks, we're, we will be filling 13 positions uh, out of 56 vacancies, uh, in, and in some very critical areas as well. Uh, 11 of those positions being filled are filled by external candidates, which means even with Chris Houston's uh, departure, uh, we're still going to go down to only having 45 vacancies within the next five weeks, provided nobody else leaves. That is not an accident. That is a reflection of some very hard work by staff in all of the business areas, uh, including uh, our human resources office, our human resources director, Katie Matthews, who isn't here today. It's too bad because she's done great work, as has her staff, Pam Pheasant, DJ Korlowitz, and Carla Hawkinsmith. I want to give credit where credit is due. The whole agency is benefiting by their efforts, and we're starting to see that pendulum swing back in the right direction so that we are staffed in a way where we can provide better service to the uh, the members and the participants. Uh, last, I, I held an agency-wide meeting. We, we've always referred to it here as the State of SIRS. It was a virtual meeting. Uh, it was intended, attended by uh, approximately 170 employees. Virtually all of the agency attended the meeting. And I, I, I really, this is my first one, and I know most of the people here, and I've been here a long time, but the message that I wanted to send, the focus of it, uh, was to reaffirm why we're here, and that is to serve the members and the participants, and explain to the employees in every business area that directly and indirectly they make a difference. Not that they can make a difference, they do make a difference, and they make a difference in the lives of our, our members, our active members and our retirees, whether they realize it or not. And I want everybody here that works for SERS to understand that. Uh, it's, a, it's a team, we all play a role, and um, I, I meet with all the new hires. I talk to the people uh, when they're leaving. Uh, I walk around here. I engage with employees. And I, I want to know what they think about how things are going. And I want them to understand uh, what they're doing uh, and how it's impacting the members. I was in the Wilkes-Barre Field Office on Wednesday. And uh, boy, if you want to learn what's going on out there, go out there and talk to the, uh, the regional counseling staff that meet with the members as customer service representatives every day. And uh, got some great insight on the, um, the goings on out there in the regions, the members, their needs, and what we're doing to meet those needs. So uh, I, I think that's very important. Uh, I fielded, I had people submit questions ahead of time, and I fielded those questions, uh, including questions about the Sears 2.0 project and many other areas. I wanted to address the employees' concerns. I made this about the employees and what they were concerned about. And um, I think I think those answers and the information that, that I gave in response to their needs uh, was, was, I think, fairly well received. I also outlined the four biggest challenges facing the agency right now. Number one, limited staff. I mean, I know uh, those numbers are about to improve, and I think improve dramatically, um, which is good because, you know, we have staff that have been working overtime for over two years straight. It's not sustainable if it doesn't change. I can't believe we've been able to hold it together this long and keep serving the members the way we do. But um, the staff limitations have been an ongoing concern, and they're going to be continue to be a concern. <coughs> With hard work, I hope to see those numbers improve even further over time. A second, high member activity. 
you know, once COVID hit, you know, member activity spiked. We thought it was a spike, and it turned out to be a plateau that has not changed. We have five full months of demographic information or uh, for 2022, and in comparison to 2021, over the course of a calendar year, our, our rates of benefit payments are 20% higher than last year, and last year was a busy year. Um, and that's, you know, retirement, death benefit, and refund payments. That's what we're here to do, pay members. And our the demands have gone up by 20% over last year, uh, which exacerbates the need to try to fill vacant positions. So high member activity. Third, um, negotiating the post-COVID business environment. You know, we're changing. It's a changing environment. Every state agency, you know, put a, put a telework a model in place that best met their business needs. SERS was not, uh, or SERS was also included in that. I think we put together a good plan, but how we're providing our business has changed, just like everybody else's has changed, as well as the needs of our members and how we serve our members. That has changed and it continues to evolve. And how we incorporate technology to meet their needs is an evolving matter. We take it very seriously, but it's a tremendous challenge. And our staff have done very well with that up to this point. Uh, and the last challenge is easy, the unexpected, whether it's legislation, um, uh, further pandemic shutdown, further changes in the COVID working environment. Uh, the unexpected is a big deal. And uh, we can't ever prepare for that, but we can be a strong organization, which will make it easier for us to deal with unexpected changes. Sorry. It wasn't it wasn't me for the record. Uh, uh, and that's uh, my administrative update, and that's what I tried to cover with the state of SERS, and I thought it was pretty well received. Um, at least that's the feedback I'm getting from staff. Second, uh, under tab nine, small letter A I I in board docs, is a uh, legislative update. Approximately a dozen pieces of legislation in both the House and the Senate at various stages of the legislative process are outlined. I do want to point out two uh, items that aren't included because they developed after the May 20th submission date of this memorandum. Uh, first, uh, Senate Bill 1251, uh, COLA was introduced um, for some state police retirees. It's not included in here if you've heard about it and you're wondering where it is. Uh, it, it did, it was introduced, I believe Senator Regan uh, introduced that, uh, Senate Bill 1251, but it was after the date of this uh, memorandum. And last and not a legislative item, uh, SERS has been asked, as has the uh, municipal retirement system and the public school retirement system, to testify before the Senate State Government Committee on Tuesday. Uh, that's June 14th, and it's going to be a limited presentation, but they're asking us to come over and talk about uh, Russia and Belarusian um, divestiture legislation. And as you're well aware, uh, the action that our board take, took uh, was consistent with other public plans and we're happy to go over there and talk about it. It's a good story to tell. The third and final item that I have to report on, which is um, I have the results of one notational ballot to announce, uh, which is located on tab nine, small letter A, III I, in board docs. Got to do something about that numbering. Um, in the administrative appeal regarding the account of Dennis Avellino Jr., docket number 2021-06, the claim of Dennis Avellino Jr., Tara Avellino filed a petition to intervene. The board voted unanimously to grant Ms. Avellino's petition to be a party in this administrative appeal, and this matter will continue to proceed through the administrative appeal process. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any questions for Joe? Okay, seeing none, uh, the other Joe is going to set us up for our executive session. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we will be going into an executive session to uh, have consultation with the lawyers, myself included, uh, to discuss litigation matters and a report from the chief compliance officer who is a member of the legal staff. These are items that are permitted under the Sunshine Act to be conducted in executive session. Before we enter executive session, please give us a minute to make a few technical changes here in the boardroom on your behalf. We will make you aware when the appropriate changes have been successfully made and attendees in the team's meeting are checked. As a reminder, the public meeting will resume on this live stream connection when the executive session is complete. In addition, SERS offers meeting notification updates via text messaging. For information on text notifications, please review our posted agenda on the SERS website. Thank you.
As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and is now being live streamed. Please proceed. Joe, you got an announcement? Okay. Okay, we are now out of executive session. Item 11 is board comments, announcements, dates to remember. Anyone for the good of the uh, welfare here? Seeing none, our next board meetings are July 18th and 25th. Well, is that 18th and 25th? So the 18th is uh, committee meetings? Is that what that is? Yes. Yes, correct? Okay. And the board meeting will be the 25th. Uh, so with that, motion to adjourn. Second. Any questions? Second. All in favor, aye. All opposed, no. Motion carried. Meeting adjourned.